core to the cloud. Okay, so this is done. And uh, so the first thing on the agenda is uh, questions and issues, open forum. Does anyone have anything that's uh, not later on on the agenda they want to discuss? Okay, I take that as no. So then uh, I edit one link to the open PRs and issues. And that's this old PR, which we didn't really move forward with. So uh, yeah, what should we do with it? Yeah, I was I was looking into it last week. I was thinking uh, that we can have some kind of base image which will contain this Lindsay repo, and we can kind of build an image with system test and use this image uh, to running the system test. But uh, I didn't proceed with that uh, with some uh, with some plan or something. I was out for four days, so hopefully I will get back into it this week. Anyone else has any comments to that? Uh, I don't really have a comment. Uh, I, I prepared the issue uh, as far as I did and um, absent some concrete idea what to improve. Uh, I don't have nothing to add. Yeah, I think it's more about where and how to use it rather than what to improve on it. So let's see if we have to find some use for it. So Marco, are you using it for development and so on still? Uh, I actually haven't used it uh, in quite a while. Um, so I'll actually probably take a bit of a look into it uh, as well. Uh, I think you can just uh, maybe wait for Jakub to really find some use for it, or if he wants to try something, then maybe you can work together to, mm -hmm. I don't know, make sure it's up to date or something. Yeah, this is uh, probably the, the first thing to make sure that the upstream master actually can build in it. Um, it's probably got some old you know, versions of uh, some tools, for example, old yeah. IJ probably. Okay, anyone, anything else to this? Or anyone has any other PRs or issues they want to discuss? Okay, if not, then I edit the currently open proposals there. So uh, we merge this uh, security proposal, uh, I think since last meeting. And that kind of unblock the stupid zoom disappear. Uh, that unblock the other two proposals around the UI and around the admin server. 
So I think for the UI proposal, we are now, if it loads actually, I think that got now quite a lot of approvals. And yesterday, Tom Bentley was the only one from the maintainers who didn't approve it yet. Uh, so maybe Tom, if you can find some time to look at it, whether there's still some comments or whether it's okay to merge it. Yeah, I can have a look at both of these. Yeah. And then I think the other one with the admin REST and GraphQL API, I think Cream updated it uh, this week. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are more approvals missing. So far only I approved it and uh, don't, but nobody else from the maintainers. So if everyone else can have a look at it and review it uh, as well so that we can get it matched as well. Yeah, I will do it. Yeah, I'll get on that as well. Yeah, me too. Does, I, I think that's the only two proposals which are open right now. Does anyone have anything else to the proposals or wants to discuss something related to them? I would guess that silence means no in this case. Uh, okay, so the next point on the agenda is the annual review. Uh, there's actually no progress about that. I wonder if we should check with someone from CNCF or if we should just wait. There were some comments from someone uh, which uh, I fixed after some discussions on Slack. Uh, so there have been some changes, uh, but they are rather small, just adding the things around the 1.0 release and uh, adding a link to the initial presentation, which we did and we were accepted into the sandbox uh, and so on. So yeah, not much change there. Okay, the next point on the agenda is the 0 20 release. I think there are now uh, three issues left. And I think this one is just waiting for the tests, which will hopefully pass. Uh, so I guess if these are resolved, then uh, unless someone has something else what should be added to the 0 20 release, I will probably try to do a release candidate over tomorrow or over the weekend. Does anyone have any objections or anything else we should add before we do the release candidate or something? I hope my audio is working with all the silence. We are here. Hey, we are here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Then one of the next points which uh, I edit was uh, around the cube from North America. So we have again this possibility to do this uh, project pavilion and office hours. And we have to decide if we want to do it or don't want to do it. Uh, So I wasn't on it on uh, August, I guess. Yeah, because I was on vacation. So I would like to know what was the experience from the others. If uh, so, it's useful. It's it's worth to do it. So we didn't do the project pavilion. 
with just the office hours. Uh, I guess, at least from my perspective, we had more people there than expected. Uh, and that were pretty much two one hour or 45 minute sessions or something like that. Uh, I wondered if you should try something. So what uh, we did as a Red Hat on the Kafka Summit was that uh, to kind of handle when the users are just there and not asking any questions. Uh, Hugo approached it more as a, as a kind of discussion panel, had prepared some questions which the different people there were answering. So I wonder if we should try to do something like uh, like that uh, for that to make sure we have some content to do if uh, there is nobody asking any questions because I think that worked quite well there. I think Simon was there as well, so uh, I'm not sure what he thinks about it, but I think that might be something how to make the office hours there a bit more lively and even share some content and kind of promote some stuff if you want. So as far as I understood, it means that it's kind of a video and audio sessions. It's not just it's, Slack and chat. It, it was it was Zoom session. Ah, like okay, one, okay. Basically. okay. I think it worked quite well. Um, I think we, as, as often, we could have been better prepared for it um, with a kind of a, a thinking a bit more in advance than we perhaps did for Kafka Summit. But um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think from my perspective, it worked quite well. Yeah, so that's, that's one thing which I think we should definitely do. I mean, the office hours at least in general. And yeah, I think as Simon said, I think having the questions kind of prepare the questions and kind of discuss them up front that might be helpful which we didn't necessarily have for the, for the Kafka Summit. But overall, I think this format can make it a bit more lively and uh, get more people to talk and uh, kind of handle the situation when nobody's really asking any questions and just want to listen. So you, are, you think that it's going to be something like, I don't know, Paolo asking a question and Jakub answering the questions. So it's- So uh, I would- I would imagine it something like, uh, hey, we have here Tom Cooper who worked on the cruise control uh, integration. Tom, can you tell us why is cruise control important and uh, oh, okay. what uh, okay. should the users know about it and uh, kind of how should they use it? And then Tom can, I don't know, in few sentences kind of explain how is the cruise control integrated? How does it work or something like that? Okay. And kind of we can have questions like this, which we can kind of go through everyone kind of talking a bit about some area which they know maybe a bit better or something like that. Yep, yeah, I like the idea. I'm fine with it. Yeah, I didn't want to put you on the spot, Tom. I, it was just a kind of an example can be something completely different, of course. So it will be, I see on the website, uh, November 17, 20. It's November 17 to 20, yeah. And then the second part, which we didn't do for you, is the project pavilion which I don't really know how that works because we never did anything there, but I think we can kind of, uh, it will work a bit like that there will be some chat where people can ask questions and I guess there will be some possibility to upload some videos or something like that for for the users to watch or something like that. And I think the main difference is that the recommended hours are something like uh, 10 till six on the first day, 12 to 7.30 on the next three days. So the rec you don't have, we don't have to do that all the time, but the recommended hours are quite a lot of time. But I think it might be worth it given 
we probably, unless someone has some talk accepted, we probably don't have a talk there. So it might be good to be at least in the project pavilion. For, for both of them, the only thing that, that I see that we should be aware of is that uh, uh, I, see, I see the timing on the website. Uh, it's the EST time zone. So it could be even something like later in the night, so 11 p.m. or midnight or something like that. Well, it's North America, right? But so the, the end times there are, the latest one is 7.30 p.m. Yeah, which is... Uh... It's not that late. Well, you I see. Just, you will just have a bit less sleep for your morning run. Yeah, no, but it's midnight, right? On our side. No, 7.30, that's like 1.30 a.m. Oh, okay, so it's worst. worst. Yeah, my, my, my only problem is that I cannot talk at that hour because I have children sleeping. So this is my only concern. So if I, we can ask to have uh, an earlier uh, office hours, it will be so better. So I think for, for the me. office hours, we could have picked the time last time. So I guess that will be the same again. And I think the pavilion is probably more about typing than talking because I... Okay, and that's I, better. I don't okay. think there will be some discussions. Or we can just leave everything to Kyle, who is in the US, right? Right, Kyle? I, I don't know, guys. I think I think seven thirty is a little late for even me. In the, uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, I, if of course, uh, if no, if, I was just kidding. Uh, it's something that we have to do all together. So, so it's not it's not too late even for me, right? So I guess I guess for Kyle, some of this would be okay. For me, some of this is or all of these are definitely okay. Uh, and I guess maybe someone else will survive one late night as well. I'm here for whatever you need me for. I'm just glad that it's in my time zone this time. This is it great? Yeah, it's in my time zone as well. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think there's anything out of your time zone. But <laughs> oh, it is 6 a.m. European time would be out of my time zone. <laughs> maybe. Which fits pretty well in my time zone. So, by the way, uh, I mean, yeah, just uh, about the, the the hours. It's the only concern about talking. It's about typing. No problem. For the panel session, is it worth thinking about any what you might call kind of friends of Strimzy? So either any folks from the schema registry or Camel K connectors or anything like that to see whether they um, would like to be involved? Or do we just want to kind of keep it strictly Strimsy focused? Uh, I guess we will have more time to think about that. Uh, we have until 15 to kind of register for that. Uh, but then we can think about that. Yeah, I think in theory, I don't know, I think some of these are easier, some of these are more complicated. Like probably talking about K-native has less kind of political complications than I don't know, talking about uh, some Red Hat or IBM projects. So yeah, I guess the KMO stuff is kind of generally recognized. K-native is generally recognized. Uh, I'm not sure that much about the registry, which is more or less a Red Hat project without a general recognition. So maybe yeah, I just think about it. I, I can see that. And uh, to be honest, even K-native is a little bit political at KubeCon. Um, I know. Yeah, I know. Last time they explicitly didn't want anything K native related, but I, I'm not sure that necessarily extends to kind of a single person uh, or two people kind of talking about it for a few minutes in one of the uh, um, 
one of the panel discussions. Yeah, and I don't think it will give anyone the feeling that it's just Red Hat slash IBM project, right? If we talk about K Native. Because I guess that's what the other companies like Google are not allowed to talk about <laughs> in their talks. <laughs> but yeah, I think we can. So I guess what we should think about is whether we just want to talk about it or whether we want to invite someone from these projects uh, and so on. I think for me, it might depend on how many sessions we have and how long they are. That if it's a, a kind of a single one hour session, then. So it's two 45 minute sessions. Okay. So, yeah, let's, let's think about it more, but there might be plenty of content just on Strimzy to be able to fill a 45 minute session. Yeah, and I think we can plug some of these things without necessarily having some people attend, right? Like, uh, we can talk about this, like connecting schema registry or KSQL is a common question. So I think we can talk about that, why it's not integrated directly into StreamZ and what are the license issues uh, and what are the alternatives uh, and things like that. Uh, and yeah, maybe we can check if we have some videos or something like that, which we can then share on the booth, for example, or on the project pavilion, how they call it. Sounds good. So, do we register for both then? Uh, is that an agreement? Uh, anyone volunteers to do it? Uh, I guess I volunteer, right? Okay, anything else to this? So I guess the next point is uh, future of stateful sets in the Kafka cluster. Uh, Tom, do you want to start about it or should I? Um, I can start off um, with sort of what, what prompted this. Um, and then we can, yeah, you can describe there are other places where it might make sense as well. So um, as part of KIP 500, um, it looks like um, Kafka is going to move toward, well, Kafka definitely is going to move towards um, having a, um, a metadata cluster um, and a separate broker cluster. and um, I can't remember the kip off the top of my head. It's something like 623. Um, it's proposed there that um, it will be, so the, um, at the moment, uh, broker IDs are, you know, sort of typically numbered um, zero and up. Um, and a broker is just a, a broker. Um, and Zookeeper provides the services which are gonna be replaced under um, kip 500. Um, in a post kit 500 world, what's being proposed is that there will be um, controller, um, a, a controller role, um, which 
may or may not be in the same JVM as the broker role. So in a production cluster, then you'd typically have them in separate JVMs um, on um, separate hosts. Um, but um, in more of a development sort of scenario, um, it would be possible to have both roles happening inside the same JVM. Um, and importantly, um, the controller uh, uh, is also identified by an ID and um, brokers and controls will share the same ID space as what's being proposed. Um, and so for Strimzy, this means that obviously at the moment brokers for us um, use the ID space zero up to however many um, replicas minus one. Um, and therefore, if we carried on sort of doing the obvious thing, um, if we were going to be running um, controllers in a separate stateful set, then we'd need to um, ensure that broker IDs and controller IDs couldn't collide, no, um, no matter sort of how much the broker stateful set got scaled up to. Um, so there's various ways of solving that. And in discussing this with um, Jakob, we sort of felt that um, one of the things that uh, solving that problem like that um, wouldn't really address would be being able to run um, a single um, pod Kafka cluster, which obviously is not really relevant for Strimzy in production, but you know there are some Strimzy users who um, use it for development who um, might appreciate not using up quite so much uh, resources in order to have two pods running where we could be running with one. Um, and this is sort of what led to the thought of, um, yeah, stateful sets sometimes aren't helpful. But this isn't the only uh, example of this. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Jakob, who I think has um, be able to furnish us with a couple of other use cases where stateful sets aren't um, particularly helpful. Sorry, Tom, just one question, uh, because I didn't dig into Keep 500. Um, when you say controller, it means uh, the controller role that we have today, right. so, or yeah. is just the name of a broker? Not, not exactly. I would probably um, not use exactly the right terminology either, to be honest. Um, so uh, at the moment, the controller is one of the brokers, and it's the broker that basically sort of communicates um, with um, Zookeeper, and in particular, the one that sort of um, updates most of the Zookeeper metadata. Um, what KIP 500 will do is there will be a, a quorum of um, metadata controllers, if you like. So one of them will be uh, elected the um, leader using the Raft protocol, which is um, some work that's uh, just recently been merged. Um, and that one will get to um, write to a um, a topic, a metadata topic, which is where the metadata will be stored. Um, and the leadership of the um, raft cluster obviously changes um, if that, um, um, yeah, JVM goes down, um, then another leader from that cluster will be elected and it's the one that gets to write to that topic um, is the, the gist of it. So whereas today there's what we call the controller is one of the brokers, um, in the future it will be one of the members of this uh, metadata cluster. So which and means it, it, that... It, it uh, may or may not also be a broker, is sort of um, the point. Ah, uh, okay. The, the ID space is kind of um, relevant there in that you could be a broker and um, one of the uh, metadata um, cluster members at the same time, but typically, typically in production, the expectation is um, that they would form separate clusters and any given JVM would just be in the one role. So it means, sorry, last question. It means that if I want to deploy a Kafka cluster with the three brokers, I can choose if I want uh, just three brokers and uh, uh, each of them will be at the same time a broker and a controller or yes. I can choose if I, I'm going to have six brokers with the three actual brokers and the other three acting as controllers. Is that yes. right? Yes. And uh, those sorts of um, configurations, obviously, you've got to make um, judgment calls about what is going to be suitable for production versus what might make sense for a sort of a development type environment. 
Okay, so when uh, I am going to have uh, the same three brokers to be brokers and controllers, then they are going to share the same IDs. While when no, I have different- No, 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 they would have two IDs. So you'd have a broker ID um, and that the, the broker is sort of one of the things running in that JVM, if you like, if you think of ah, JVM okay. as a, a container for, um, yeah, bits of code. Um, but uh, it would also have a separate ID. So it might be that um, broker, you know, ID one is for a broker, but ID 12 is for, um, yeah, one of these uh, members of the uh, metadata cluster. Okay, yeah, so yeah. they can share VMs, but they cannot share IDs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else has anything to add Tom said about the key 500 or can I continue with some of the other reasons? Okay, so I think there are some more things where the state pool sets are kind of uh, bad or not completely useful. Uh, so one thing which is really complicated and messy is the storage handling because the state pool sets are really designed to uh, have the persistent volume claim templates and use them to create the persistent volumes uh, and uh, driving that through the stateful set is complicated because big part of these things is immutable. So uh, it makes it hard to do things like change the volumes, resize disks and so on. So we already do a lot of hacking around it by kind of creating first the PVCs before creating the stateful set and trying to manage them separately. There's sometimes, I would not say that's that often, but sometimes we have also user requests for things like uh, asymmetric storage or resources configuration to have kind of different kind of brokers or different kinds of storage in different brokers. Uh, and we already support that to some extent by letting the user specify the per broker storage class, which again is basically a hack bypassing the stateful set. Uh, and uh, then one of the other things which come up sometimes is uh, that uh, uh, by using staples they always delete the brokers from the end we cannot kind of delete the brokers from the beginning or uh, delete the brokers from the middle which of course makes it, for example, hard to kind of, once you screw up your storage configuration and use the wrong storage class, you are kind of fucked up, so to say. Uh, whereas if you would be, for example, able to delete the brokers from the beginning, you can spin new brokers with completely new storage, then you can move the topics easily uh, by reassignments and then delete the brokers from the beginning with the wrong storage. That's right now, basically not something we can easily do without hacking with the storage, which usually involves some uh, offline changes when the broker is not working. Uh, then another thing uh, which, uh, where this is often a problem, is uh, that the stateful set defines the whole configuration of the pods below it. So for example, the things like config maps, which are used, environment variables, which are defined, are all defined centrally in the stateful set and then from the stateful set propagated into the pods, which again often brings a lot of problems like we need to roll the whole cluster just because, for example, the load balance address for single broker changed because it's all driven through the same kind of configuration. It's not easy to kind of handle this individually. And then uh, something what's fairly big topic in uh, some of the discussions here inside Red Hat is uh, the idea of stretch clusters across multiple Kubernetes and uh, or OpenShift clusters uh, to have kind of one broker running in this cube cluster, another one in this cube cluster, another one somewhere else. And uh, while that's on its own, it's kind of a huge amount of work and uh, there's a lot of other complexities than just the stateful sets. The stateful sets are obviously a prerequisite by this doesn't work easily. 
because if you have the state set which creates the three brokers, then the state set is limited to a single cluster and you cannot say, okay, this spot should be running here, this spot should be running there, this spot should be running somewhere else. So kind of getting rid of the state set will not uh, give us in any way the stretch cluster feature, but it's something what's more or less a prerequisite uh, for being able to do the stretch clusters or being able to kind of do things like migrate from one cube cluster to another by shifting the pods one by one uh, uh, from one cluster to another and so on. So I would say for this, getting rid of the state set is probably a prerequisite. Any questions or comments to this? So then I guess one of the things which we should discuss is uh, what is it actually, so these were all the problems which STS, the state sets cause us, uh, but there's obviously might be something what they actually do for us. But I think the only thing which I was able to came up with is that uh, when running within the stateful set, if you delete the pod, then the pod is automatically restarted uh, by uh, by uh, the operator. Whereas uh, if you would run directly operate on the pod level, then obviously you always have to be the operator who starts a new pod after the old one was deleted or whatever. Uh, so that means that uh, right now, for example, if the cluster is somehow running and the operator shut down for whatever reason, even if some pods get deleted or lost, the state for set controller will recreate them. If you drive the pods directly, uh, then uh, the operator has to run and recreate them basically manually by creating the pod resource again. And that in one way or another impacts uh, also uh, and other things like uh, how quickly they are recreated, because for example, if you just remove the state full set layer from the current implementation of the operator, then the reconciliation would recreate them. So they would recreate only every two minutes or something like that if they get deleted, uh, which can be mitigated by having some watches on the pods uh, as well to alert us when they are deleted or lost to speed it up. But I, this is kind of the, first thing which I came up uh, with uh, as, uh, as something what we get from the stateful set and what we would need to kind of replicate if we get rid of the stateful set. But there might be others, it's not like I have done a prototype or something like that. So I guess that's kind of the introduction to the problem and or the, to the problems and the possible solutions. And I'm not completely sure what Tom was expecting for this, but it would be good to see if someone uh, has some more things where this helps or some more things which we will need to implement on our own if we get rid of the stateful sets and whether this is something what seems to make sense to most of us. In which case, uh, I guess we can try to do some prototyping or write some proposals uh, and so on. Yeah, I think unless someone can come up with some killer reason why not, I think it would be worthwhile um, doing a, a small sort of prototyping exercise uh, to inform a proposal before we sort of um, push ahead with it. Um, Do you have any initial ideas of how you'd prototype this? Well, you just edit the operator, right? Do not use the stateful set. Yeah, but but what would you use instead of a stateful set is, is what I was trying to ask. Well, you, nothing, right? So kind of basically in the places where we today create the stateful set or edit the stateful set, you would need to create or edit the pods for each broker. Uh, in uh, 
probably the biggest change is then also in the rolling updates where today we just delete the broker and wait for the for Kubernetes to recreate the pod. So we delete the pod and just wait for it to get recreated and get ready again. Whereas this would need to be changed to delete the pod and then we would actually need to come and create the new version of the pod. Uh, yeah. So basically the rolling updates would need to be rewritten in this way and uh, the creation of the stateful set would need to be replaced with the creation of the, of the pod. So we did something similar um, in an old event streams release where we created like N stateful sets um, where N is the number of brokers that you want. And that allowed us to do multi-zone. And then of course you get that Kubernetes manages that individual pod for you. So that could be an alternative where we keep using stateful sets, but instead scale it down to one each. And then you get all the benefits of stateful sets without the, you know, if you wanted to get rid of a specific ordinal, you just get rid of that stateful set, right? Yeah, it will be still quite hard to handle some of the changes because some of the things in the stateful set are immutable in the, in the pod yes. template. So, uh, yeah, it could be an alternative, I guess. Uh, but I'm, to be honest, I'm personally not completely sure if that brings enough advantages over managing the pods directly. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. But in the way that um, uh, Samuel was proposing, you can, for example, stretch the clusters, right? You can change configuration individually for brokers. So it's able to address some of the issues that we have. Some of the issues, yes. The asymmetric storage as well, I guess. The ch one of the challenges there would be, I guess, the naming of the pods, but I guess you can have the index inside a stateful set name. The, the things around the asymmetric storage, it can be asymmetric, but it doesn't make the updates easier because of how the stateful set drives these things. So anyway, I think this was kind of introduction why it might make sense. Do we want everyone to kind of think about it until the next meeting and then uh, get back to it? Uh, to give everyone some more time to think about it and so on. I guess me and Tom maybe talked about it uh, a bit more, but it's probably not fair to expect everyone to come up with all the possible issues and so on within five minutes now. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, even because it can provide us the time yeah, to, to check even the source code and try to understand what is the impact of this kind of change. And if uh, applying the solution of removing totally stateful set uh, compared to the one solution provided by Sam, staying with stateful set for bound broker. Yeah, I think that uh, it's good having more time for that, yeah. I think as well, if, if we're just managing pods, unless we're managing them in a separate vertical, we could run into weird problems where something else in the cluster has gone down and it sort of gates us from getting to the pod management phase or, or whatever in the, in the uh, reconcile loop. <clears throat> Obviously, I think in the end we we design around that, but I do see anticipate some potential problems, especially if people turn the reconcile timer up. Uh, if a pod goes down, they could wait quite a while before a pod comes back up. Yeah. So what I would imagine this would work out um, as looking like, but not sort of wanting to. Um 
prejudge any sort of um, experimentation that people might do um, is, yeah, we'd probably have a separate vertical which would sort of take on the role of the stateful set controller um, in that it would be watching the pods and would spin up new ones um, and, you know, possibly some sort of communication between um, the two in order to coordinate um, rolling restarts if necessary um, would be maybe how it looked. Um, but, you know, sort of keeping it um, separate and having, um, yeah, independence of the uh, reconciliation loop used in the cluster operator. I think that makes a lot of sense. Can happen, for example, that um, just a kind of hacking the system. Someone can, and just thinking aloud, can, uh, so let's imagine that we get rid of the state food set and uh, we have all the pods just handled by our uh, control uh, cluster operator. Uh, and we want just, uh, yeah, three brokers and one pod per uh, broker. And at some point, someone just create a state food set where the selector is able to handle these pods and uh, it increased the number of replicas and increasing the number of pods, increasing the number of brokers. And then we actually take an action only on the next reconcile. Is that possible? I mean, are you saying that if someone decides to mess up and break it, that they can mess up and break it? Yeah. Because that's how it sounds to me. They can do it today as well, right? Well, today, oh, yeah, because if you change the stateful set, uh... I don't think that's really possible actually, because the replica set controller um, is quite careful about um, which pods it takes ownership of. I can't remember the exact details, but it is um, sort of documented um, how it does it. They won't go sort of um yeah adopting pods which don't really belong to it or it shouldn't do well it's not just about the selector so if i create a stateful set uh, selecting the pods with some specific it, labels the, the replica mm -hmm. set underneath the stateful set will be able to to change the number or well if you change the replicas on stateful set it will change the number of pods running and yeah it's buy. about the owner as well though Sorry, Tom. It's about the owner. Yeah. So the the pods are owned by a, a replica set, which is owned by a stateful set, and a replica set can adopt pods if um, if there's they've got no a replica set between stateful set and pods. But yeah, there is some kind of ownership thing in addition to the selector. It's not completely so easy, but I'm quite sure you can mess up with it if you want. But I'm when talking quite about sure owner, you... when talking about owner, you are saying that uh, in this case we are getting the ownership of the pods, so our uh, us as the operator, and uh, some other entity. So let me say some other re a replica set is not uh, able to get the ownership. Is that what you mean? It sounds like to me that the the operator would just be managing it. The replica set would still be an owner if we used a replica set, or the CR would be. Guys, the the set. there's no replica set for stateful sets. It's just oh, yeah. a stateful set controller. Good but point. so anyway, Paula, I'm not sure I understand where are you heading. So if someone decides to mess up with it by messing up with the resources and the pods, I'm quite sure they can do it even today. Yeah, that's true. I was just thinking about the, 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 the reaction time of the operator. If today the operator, if you change something on state foot set, the operator is kind of reacting immediately on the change on state foot set while in the mm -hmm. removing it, we... Oh, we the, operator doesn't do, the operator doesn't react to changes to the state foot set. 
nobody just react, react to yeah yeah just, yeah, yeah just to the custom resource yeah just to the custom resource yes right so it's the same yeah i was just thinking about if something could be messed up easily so anyway guys i think everyone should think about it and we should get back to it because there's one more point on the agenda and we have just seven minutes left so uh, the next point is publishing updated images after the release uh, and i guess tom you edited so you can give us the background yeah uh well something we've talked about before but not for a, a while um i thought it might be worth worth uh revisiting um so at the moment when we do a, a stream release we um you know we sort of build um all the jar files and we um build the images um and we say the release is done um and then at some future point there'll be some other release but in the meantime uh, we don't provide any updates um, if there are um, any changes in the base image, for instance, if there are updates to um, CentOS or the um, JVM or whatever, any sort of bug fixes or CVE fixes or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, because although we sort of try to get releases out on a sort of a fairly regular cadence, um you know uh sometimes these release dates sort of do slip a little bit um and we don't have any sort of um container health sort of monitoring either um so i think it would be nice obviously for the community if we were able to um update the images to deal with um changes in the base image at least um before you know before we sort of ready to release the next version um i just sort of wonder if that's something that we feel that we can bite off at this point because obviously it wouldn't happen for free um i think at the moment what i'm suggesting would be um just be able to put the infrastructure in place to be able to do um this sort of um sort of publication of new images um rather than um sort of necessarily setting up um container health checks and all the rest of it all that sort of scanning type stuff um any thoughts that people have about that so i think the problem is so to some extent we can do it to some extent we cannot do it like it's quite easy to go and press the button and rerun the whole tag build, which builds and pushes the images. But that has some bad consequences, like there's no test process between when it's pushed live. And there's also not necessarily a good process how to get these updated images out to the users. So I guess ideally you would want to have a more complicated process where maybe you rerun just the rebuild of the image, but mainly where you have some staging uh, Docker images, which you can take and you can test them. And uh, then you can kind of press another button to push them into the live registry. Because the way it works right now, so when we do it, when we are doing a new release, for example, then before I announce the release and uh, publish all the releases on GitHub and so on, uh, kind of nobody knows about these container images and nobody is using them basically. So that gives us time to kind of go and test these images before we kind of do the announcements and uh, publish the release on GitHub and uh, uh, publish it to the operator hub and so on. Whereas if you do the rebuild in the middle, then uh, uh, then uh, there will be users already using these images and maybe pulling them every now and then. And if you push the images directly live and something went wrong in whatever reason, then uh, that affects actual users and possibly their actual 
applications, right? So I think one thing we would need there would be this step in between, but it still doesn't solve the other problem, how to get the updated images to the actual users, because uh, the text for the release images, they have by default, if not present, pool policy. So uh, even if we leave aside the things like the user copied the images somewhere to uh, uh, some separate registry, uh, which is private, then they still, if they are already running it, they might not pull the new images with the CV fixes uh, anyway, unless they specifically change the policy or use the digests uh, and so on. So that's kind of some of the issues with the current process. One of the kind of cheap ways how to solve some of these, but create others, is that we can say that every new CVE fixes to the base image. It's basically a patch release, right? So we would, for example, just go to the release branch for 019. We would create out of that 0191 and build that as a new patch release where the only change would be basically the, uh, the CVE uh, in the base image or the changes to the base image, uh, but the software would be the same. And then that gives us a separate path how to kind of test the release, uh, make sure it works and only then publish it. But that means that the users would actually need to follow the releases and the users would actually need to uh, kind of update their installation files and the operator to get the updated images. So even those who by coincidence would pull the latest images from the Docker Hub with the fixes, they would now need to do some intentional steps to get it fixed. But on the other hand, it's basically no change for us, right? We just, when we see the need, we will just uh, do the patch release, pass it through our test process as any other release and uh, release it basically. And we do not need any uh, complicated changes to our pipelines and any staging registries or staging uh, images and so on. So I guess we've uh, started to overrun a little bit. So um, I guess we can leave it there for now. If um, other people have thoughts, maybe we can pick it up next time. I mean, of those two options, I, I guess I would prefer um, improving our processes so that we could do it the sort of the, the first way that Jakob described, but um, I realise that that sort of um, messing around with the build is uh, never much fun. It's not just messing around with the build, right? It's also the approach where kind of you might not push it really the fixes to some of the users who would be interested in it. But then you might have a lot of other users who would say, I tested this image, I know it works. Why are you now pushing some new image on me, which I haven't tested yet? So I guess it's maybe also something we should ask the users. I mean, that's what, what the image pull policy is for though, right? Not, yeah. Not really right. Uh, so A, you can have users who have more air gap environments and they have private registries where they would need to manually mirror the images. Uh, yeah. Pool policy, not image pool policy. But then there are also practical problems, right? You don't really want to push, you don't necessarily want to pull the same image again and again, maybe because you know it takes a long time in your bare metal cluster with whatever connectivity and million firewalls uh, to the internet. So you don't do it for the speed, but you still want to get uh, 
the updates, for example, right? Yeah. So I think that was maybe the idea behind the pool policy, but I don't think it in reality works as easily as the kind of uh, simple binary choice. But then even if you kind of, it brings different challenges as well, right? So if you don't use the pool always policy, it can still happen that the broker gets scheduled on a brand new node, which doesn't have the image yet, pulls the fresh version, while other node is running some older version uh, because it had it uh, and so on. I think it's fairly, fairly messy in general how this is dealt with. But obviously it's not, it's not black and white, right? Because it also means that some users will get the fixes without actually needing to do anything, which then on the other hand for some of the users might be actually a good thing. Yeah, certainly no one size fits all in this case. Yeah. kind of the advantage of the approaches like the operator hub has, uh, where you can basically control this on a, on a different level. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think we are out of time. So is that something what again, everyone takes home, thinks about it, and then we get back to it next week. I think it is something what users are asking about regularly. Uh, sometimes it's base image CVs, sometimes it's some dependencies, which is a different story. But having at least clear opinion and clear policy, what to do and how to do it, if someone comes with some important JVM CV, it would be a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I did read about, um... We're going over time, so let's uh, save it till next time. But please, everyone else, think about it uh, so that we can get faster to some decision. Okay, we are over time. Anyone has anything else that can be solved quickly? what they definitely need to solve today. If not, then uh, I guess uh, thanks for joining and uh, the next community meeting in two weeks should be the morning one. So see you there, I guess, or on Slack in the meantime. See you all. Bye.